Here's a really cool integral that appeared as an exercise in Paul Nayan's book, Inside Interesting Integrals. And the context for this integral is that it was actually, it actually appeared in a Cambridge University exam back in the day. And by back in the day, I mean the year 1886. It was an integral calculus exam and the students were required to evaluate this very integral. So it does look like a pretty cool integral to assign in an exam, but let's see what it evaluates to. For reference purposes, I'm gonna call the integral here i, as always. And notice first up that I can complete the square for the argument of the square root function. So let me just write this as the integral from zero to four of log x divided by the square root of negative sign x squared. This will be a negative four x term now. So I'm gonna have a plus four here. And this is actually a negative four because of the negative sign outside. So I need a plus four outside here as well. Integration with respect to x. And let me just neaten this up. That looks pretty messy indeed. And I'm a Cristiano Ronaldo fan anyway. So we have the integral from zero to four of log x dx divided by the square root of four minus x minus two squared. And now what? Well, we could make a substitution here that seems pretty obvious. We're gonna let x minus two equal two times the sine of u. Yeah, that'll work nicely. So when x equals zero, we have zero minus two equal to two times sine u, which implies that u in this case would be negative pi by two. And if x equals four, we have four minus two being equal to two times sine u, which implies that in this case, u would be positive pi by two. And what about the differential element? Well, this implies that dx would be two times the cosine of u du. So that means our integral i in the u world transforms into an integral from negative to positive pi by two of log, what exactly is x now? Well, that should be two plus two times the sine of u divided by the square root of four minus four times the squared sine of u and the differential element is two times cosine u du. And the denominator here sorts out to be two times cosine u as well. So we have some nice cancellation. And this implies that i equals the integral from negative to positive pi by two of log two plus two times the sine of u du. Oh, we, nah, the factor two cancel out, canceled out there as well, okay. So I can factor out a cancel of two from the argument of the logarithm function as well. And in that case, I can use the properties of the logarithm to split it into two logarithms. So I have one integral from negative to positive pi by two of log two du, which we know would be pi times log two, plus an integral from negative to positive pi by two of log one plus the sine of u du. Okay. So how exactly do we approach this integral here? Well, a nice line of attack would be to expand it into two integrals. That is, I can write the right-hand side as pi times log two, plus the integral from negative pi by two to zero, plus an integral from zero to pi by two of log one plus sine u du. Now let's study the behavior of this integral under a transformation from the u realm to the negative u realm. So let's write it or refer to it as i sub one, integral from negative pi by two to zero, log one plus sine u du, and we transform from u to negative u. So in that case, we have the integral from pi by two to zero of log one minus sine u because the sine function is an odd function and the differential element becomes a negative du. And I can get rid of this negative sign, of course, by switching up the limits of integration. So this is the integral I now have. And now let's plug it back into the equation we first wrote out in orange. So this implies that I equals pi times log two. Oh, terribly sorry about that. And notice that you have two integrals from zero to pi by two, so you can add them up using the linearity of the integration operator. And that means if you have log one plus 
sine u plus the logarithm of 1 minus sine u using the properties of the logarithm, you can just combine them into a single log. So we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log 1 plus sine u times 1 minus sine u would be 1 minus the squared sine of u du. And we know exactly what the 1 minus squared sine is, right? That's the squared cosine. So that means on the right-hand side, we have pi times log 2 plus the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log cosine squared u du, where once again, using the properties of the logarithm, I can just write this as 2 times the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log cosine u, which we recognize as one of Euler's log trick integrals that evaluates out to negative pi by 2 times log 2. So this implies that i equals pi times log 2 plus 2 times negative pi by 2 times log 2. And we see that we have some nice cancellation. And this implies that the integral is 0, which is OK for an exam purpose. I think it's a very nice question for examination purposes, but not exactly for exploration purposes as the integrals we normally solve here. So I thought of evaluating a variation of this integral. A variation, I mean, I have exactly the same integrand. I have log x divided by square root for x minus x squared, but I'm integrating this with respect to x from 0 to 2, and this yielded a much nicer result. So we have exactly the same approach. We complete the square in the denominator and get the integral now from 0 to 2 of log x divided by square root 4 minus x minus 2 squared dx. We perform exactly the same substitution that is letting x minus 2 equal to 2 times sine u. And in this case, we have the integral from, again, the zero limit transforms to negative pi by 2. But the difference here is the upper limit. The upper limit is 2, and in the u world, that translates to a 0. That's the only difference. And that makes all the difference in this case. So we have the integral from negative pi by 2 to 0 of log 2 plus 2 times sine u du. And now to evaluate it, again, using the properties of the logarithm, factoring out a 2 from the argument, we have the integral from negative pi by 2 to 0 of log 2, which is, of course, a positive pi by 2 times log 2, plus an integral from negative pi by 2 to 0 of log 1 plus the sine of u du. For this integral, we'll perform a transformation from the u realm to the negative u realm, and then get pi by 2 times log 2 plus the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log 1 minus sine u, because the sine function is, again, an odd function, du. Okay, now it's going to be easier to work with cosines than sines, and let me show you why. First, we need a transformation. We let u equal to pi by 2 minus t, which implies that du equals negative dt. So this implies that i equals pi by 2 times log 2 plus an integral from this would be pi by 2 to 0, but I'm still going to write this as, pi, as 0 to pi by 2, flipping the limits so I can get rid of the extra negative sign. So I have this integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log 1 minus the sine turns into a cosine because of this pi by 2 phase shift. So we have cosine t dt. Okay. And why exactly is it easier to work with the cosine function? Well, that's because of the double angle formula of the cosine function. We know that the cosine of t can be written as 1 minus 2 times the squared sine of t by 2. So this implies that 2 times the squared cosine of t by 2, yeah, the squared sine of t by 2, that is, equals 1 minus the cosine of t. Alrighty then, so we have i equal to pi by 2 plus an integral from 0 to pi by 2. Uh, oh wait, this is pi by 2 times log 2. Terribly sorry about that. Forgot the loggy boy here. Going to play a big part in the final result later. And we have log 
2 times sine squared t by 2. Again, using the properties of the logarithm, we can split this log into two logs, and we have pi by 2 times log 2 plus an integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log 2. Again, this would just be pi by 2 times log 2. Okay, plus an integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log sine squared. So we can just write that as 2 times the logarithm of sine t by 2, again using the properties of the logarithm. And of course, we can just combine them into pi log 2s that I'm sure David Goggins would love to carry. Yeah, I think he'd like carrying pi number of logs. So we know exactly who's going to carry these logs, and we have one more integral to evaluate. How exactly are we going to evaluate this? Well, okay. First, let's make a substitution. We're going to let t by 2 equal to phi, which implies that dt equals 2 times d phi. So we have i being equal to pi times log 2 plus 4 times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 now of log sine phi d phi. Now, if we had the integral from 0 to pi by 2, we could have just plugged in that result from Euler's log trig integral. So the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log sine as well as log cosine both equal negative pi by 2 times log 2. But the case for 0 to pi by 4 needs some extra effort. So I'm going to invoke one of my favorite infinite series expansions. That's the series expansion for 2 times log 2 times the sine of phi. And this sorts out to negative sum over the positive integers k of the cosine of 2k phi. In this case, the variable I'm using is phi divided by k. So we expand the left-hand side, again using the properties of the logarithm, and get log sine phi equal to negative log 2 minus the sum over k of the cosine of 2k phi divided by k. And we integrate from 0 to pi by 4. Okay, cool. And the first term over here on integration will give us, obviously, negative pi by 4 times log 2 minus Switching up the summation and the integration operators, I have the sum over k of the integrals from 0 to pi by 4 of the cosine of 2 k phi divided by k d phi. And of course, you can write this 1 by k term outside the integration operator because it's independent of the phi variable. So on the right-hand side, we have negative pi by 4 times log 2 minus the sum over k of 1 by k on integrating the cosine term, we have the sine of 2k phi divided by 2k, with the limits being 0 and pi by 4. And evaluating, and evaluating the limits gives us an interesting result. We have the sum over k, one half the sum anyway because of this factor of 1 by 2, the sum over k of 1 by k squared times the sine of k times pi by 2 for the upper limit and for the lower limit, we have sine of 0, which is, of course, always 0. Now, if k is some even integer, then we have sine of an integer multiple of pi, which is 0. So the only values of k we're interested in are values of this form, k equals 2n plus 1, where n is some non-negative integer. So this implies that the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of log sine phi d phi equals negative pi by 4 times log 2 minus 1 half, the sum over k. And now in the denominator, you have 2n plus 1 squared. And what about the sine term? Well, the sine term sorts out to sine of 2n plus 1 times pi by 2, which is negative 1 to the n. Yes, it should be negative 1 to the n, because if n equals 0, you have sine of pi by 2, which is a positive 1. OK, so that's exactly what we have is the numerator, and this sum here is none other than top g. That's right, Catalan's constant. So we have negative pi by 4 times log 2 minus 1 half of top g. 
And what exactly were we supposed to do with the result of this integral? Let me just trace back my steps to the target case over here. So we needed to multiply the result by 4 and add to it pi times log 2. Okay, cool. So returning to this integration result, I need to multiply it by 4. This implies that my target integral i equals pi times log 2 minus pi times log 2 minus 2 times Catalan's constant. So you see, carrying the logs wasn't so bad after all. They cancelled out. And we conclude that negative 1 half of the integral from 0 to 2 of log x dx divided by the square root of 4x minus x squared is another cool representation of top g, that is Catalan's constant. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.